that on all the social medias coming over. We're going to do the state comparison. Uh, before we get rolling here, tell everybody a little bit about you, what it is that you do, and uh, your new product that we're so proud of. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much, guys, for uh, for coming down here. It's a pleasure to be here. It's my third year attending the uh, the X Fest. It's a great time. Shout out to Colway for uh, hosting an amazing event. It's a uh, it's a great uh, great company. They have great products. So thank you again, David. Um, so anyways, my name is Maciek. I run the Grill with that social media channels. And we do uh, easy to follow, cooking, grilling, smoking, recipes, all cooked at home, uh, mostly on a big green egg, which is what we're doing today. And so uh, today we'll be doing a demo on three different kinds of beef. So we've got some awesome uh, rib roll samples. We've got a, a grass-fed rib roast. We've got a grain finish and an American leg. So we're gonna go over all three kinds and kind of explain what separates them, what makes them different. We'll cut them into individual steaks. We'll grill a couple of them here on stage and then we'll do the rest of them right by my tent over there. So uh, it should be a, a pretty fun pretty fun demo here because who doesn't like a giant hunk of meat, right? Look at this thing. So there you go. Hold on to my kale. I'm going to put my gloves on and uh, we'll get right to it. So yeah, quick plug for my uh, brand new rub. So this is Dad's All Purpose Seasoning. This was a, a couple years in the making, kind of a delicious, I think delicious, all-purpose rub, really good on everything, uh, meat, veggies, grilled meats, smoked meats, we're going to season the steaks with this rub today so you guys get a chance to try it, uh, we also have some chicken wings that we're doing so you can try that chicken as well, but uh, let's get uh, let's get right into the demo here and show you what, uh, what we've got, so again we've got three different kinds of rib roast, so this is the grass fed, Fred's Farm, local company, and uh, Tranquil Valley Ranch was the American Wagyu. They're very similar in marbling, so they do look uh, close, and let me take these out so you guys can get a better look. Move this out of the way. Okay, so this, This is the whole prime rib roast, right? So this is what you use to cut out ribeye steaks. So if you go to the grocery store, this is right what a ribeye steak looks like. You have your center cut, you have your ribeye cap. Uh, if you are familiar with like a tomahawk steak or a bone-in ribeye, there will be the bone that's attached right here on the bottom. If you're doing a holiday prime rib roast, sometimes they come with the three bones attached on the bottom. This is boneless, all three of these are. But this is basically what you would use to make and cut out uh, ribeye steaks, okay? So this is the first one. I'll take all three of them out so you guys can see the difference in marbling and I'll explain what that is once they are all out of their packaging. If there's any questions throughout, just uh, raise your hand. We want to make this as interactive as possible. If you guys uh, want to know anything, just shout it out or Caleb can walk up with the mic. And, while you're opening that up, you know, if folks are out at their local butcher or at the grocery store and they're trying to pick out a steak, uh, especially like a, a ribeye that's already cut, you know, what is it that they're really looking for to get the best steak? Yeah, so that's uh, that's marbling. That's what I mentioned before. And I'll show you guys the difference. Do you have any paper towels? Uh, I'll let these guys dry real quick. Oh, there it is. That just dry so it's a little bit easier to see. Okay. Okay, so right away in these two, okay, so you've got one and you've got the other. And the main difference right away, just looking at it without even you know knowing which one's which, is you can see this one has more marbling, right? That's the white lines that are running throughout the uh, the rib rows. This one has a little bit less, this one has a little bit more. So when you're at a butcher, you're at a grocery store, you're looking for steaks, the main thing you should always look for is to try to find one that has more of this marbling, these lines in between, right? There's the little fat muscles or little fat pockets that run throughout the muscle. This is what's gonna make your steak nice and juicy, tender. It's gonna keep it kind of nice and moist inside. So that's a, uh, that's a key indicator of one of the main things to look for. So let's get this last one out and then we'll compare all three of them. Okay. Ooh. This is some quality meat. Okay. Perfect. 
perfect. Okay, this one was the tranquil stress farm. Gross fat. Okay, so let's put the leg you at the end. Okay, so we've got the three kinds of rib rolls. So we've got the uh, grass fed, grain finish, and American Wagyu. Uh, the one that's really different is the American Wagyu one. So this is a cross between Japanese Wagyu cows and American Angus. Uh, maybe you've seen this on social media or on TV. The uh, Japanese A5 Wagyu, like the steaks that are just pretty much all kind of fat, where they cut them super thin, sear them hot and fast. So this is kind of a step below that, right? So they take these Japanese, Wagyu cows and they breed them with American Angus cows and you end up with American Wagyu beef. So this is the most expensive cut out of all three of these. It has the most marbling. Uh, it's kind of has a very, and you'll see this once we cook these up, has a very kind of a luxurious and, you know, this packed full of flavor mouthfeel, right? When you bite into it, you kind of these little pockets of fat kind of explode in your mouth. It is, it is, it is really delicious. The, uh, Grain finish, okay, so grain finish, so all cows, when they're from birth to about six or eight months, they all kind of feed on grass, right? They all eat grass outside, just kind of graze. For the grain finish cows, they're finished with a grain diet to kind of fatten them up a little bit, right? This kind of, and this is a sort of a personal preference, and you'll see this once we cook these up. It's not to say that one is better than the other. They just have a little different taste, a little different mouthfeel to them. They're going to cook a little bit differently. Uh, from one to the other. Uh, usually, usually the grain finish beef tends to be a little fattier, right? That's the purpose of kind of finishing them with the grain diet compared to a grass fed diet where the cow is basically just outside grazing, eating grass, uh, no grain finish, uh, tends to have more of a tougher kind of mouthfeel to it, right? Because it's not, it's a little bit more dense compared to the grain finish, but again, it's all personal preference. Some people prefer one to the other, but uh, flavor-wise, they're all going to be very similar, right? It's still high-quality beef, all three of them. As you can see, all three are very nicely marbled. So it's really, again, it comes down to what you like when you cook your steaks. Do you want them to just kind of dissolve in your mouth, you know, not really require a lot of effort to chew? That's, you know, you go for this kind of American Wagyu uh, beef. If you like a little bit more of a chew to your steak, have a little better mouthfeel, you know, you go for the uh, uh, the grass-fed cow. If you kind of want to mix in between, the grain finish is, is kind of the way to go. Okay, so that's a, a quick overview on what makes them different and what separates them. Uh, there's also an argument, you know, for nutritional value that the uh, grain finish has a higher value of omega fatty acids, has a little bit more fat content. Uh, that's kind of debatable, I think, but uh, overall, you really can't go wrong with one or the other. So uh, that's that's kind of how that works. So let's cut these guys up. And when you get a whole piece like this, and you're going to cut them up into steaks, how thick are you usually cutting your steaks? Yeah. So you know, actually, before we cut it, so you can, if you're doing a prime rib roast for the holidays, you can buy this whole rib roast and cook it as is. Right, so if you're cooking a whole rib roast on a big green egg, my go-to method is to just season. You can trim the fat a little bit. A lot of it's going to kind of render out. Uh, you can trim it just a little bit, season pretty heavily, all sides. It goes on a big green egg, indirect heat, about 250, 275 degrees, start to finish, and you're going to cook it to about 120 internal or so. That's for a medium rare finish. Pull it off and rest it for a good 20 minutes or so. A bigger bigger uh, roast like this is going to carry over a lot more after you pull it off the grill. So if you're going for a medium rare final temperature cook, which is about 130 degrees internal, you have to pull about 10 or 15 degrees below that, put it on your countertop, loosely cover with foil, and in about 20 minutes this thing's going to be sitting at about 130 internal. If you take this to 130 on the grill, pull it off, rest it, it's going to carry over to about 140. So it's going to be more of a medium finish, right? So that's an easy thing to overlook. People kind of always check those internal temperatures. 
they kind of go higher on the grill, they rest it, and they're like, oh my gosh, my steak is overcooked. You just better remember, pull it off sooner, rest, and it's going to carry over uh, during that rest period, right? Can and, you talk real quick uh, about meat thermometers when you're doing this? So something you leave in the grill versus just like an instant read? What do you yeah. prefer? So there's a couple different uh, uh, tools out there. You can buy a thermometer, a probe that will kind of go inside the meat. You put that whole thing on the grill, you get a little display readout and it tells you the temperature as it's cooking so you know when to pull it off, right? That's a great tool for a roast size cook like this because you know exactly where it's sitting at. If you don't have one like that, you can use what's called an instant reading thermometer, right? So these, it's usually something like this, right? You stick this in your meat while it's on the grill and it tells you that instant temperature uh, of it that's inside, right? So this also works really well. I always check at the end with this, you know, to make sure that it's the right temperature. And really this is the, the people always ask, you know, what they can do to improve their cooking, to be better uh, on the grill, just get a meat thermometer. If you read a recipe or you follow a recipe, even my recipes on my website, and I say, you know, grill for 20 minutes, you know, my grill is a little bit different from yours. A charcoal grill cooks differently from a gas grill. So you can't always go by time. You always have to cook the temperature to really make sure that it's cooked, you know, to the way that it should be cooked, not overcooked and not undercooked. Uh, and then let's see. So, so you've got the meat temp uh, temperatures, you've got the roast, again, cooking a bigger size roast is actually simpler than cutting it into steaks and cooking individual steaks. You know, individual steaks that you cut thin and grill, it's super easy to overcook because you don't really have that much time to adjust the temperatures, the times. A whole roast like this, this will take about two and a half to three hours to cook at 250 degrees. So plenty of time to adjust your temperature, check the internal readings without, you know, overcooking or undercooking it. Uh, but we're going to cut this into steaks so we can actually grill some of these up and you guys can taste and see what it's like. For cutting them into steaks, I like the kind of two finger method, right? That's kind of how thick we're going to cut it. So just you put your two fingers on the side, right? So you know exactly how thick to go. Uh, so we'll just flip this guy like this. So I'm right handed, so put your two fingers down, put your knife right there, right? And then just go right down the middle. And we'll cut a nice steak out of our rib roast. Okay, so you've got a nice ribeye, it's about what, like an inch, inch and a half or so. Uh, you can see there's a lot of this thicker fat around, so I'm going to trim this off now after I cut my steak. Because we're going to be cooking these hot and fast, and I'll go over that in just a minute. This fat is not going to have enough time to render out. So once this is cooked, it's going to be very hard and not very, not very pleasant to, uh, to eat. So after you cut your steak, just take your knife and then just shave off this kind of hard fat that's around. We're just going to trim it down a little bit. Okay, so it looks nice and it's going to cook much, much better that way. Now, a lot of times we hear about this finalis muscle on a ribeye. Can you go over a little bit about what that is? I sure can. So as I mentioned when I held this thing up and you can really see it here, right? You kind of have two sections of the ribeye. You've got the center, the eye of the ribeye, and then there's a muscle that goes right around, right? Right here. Uh, you can see it here on this individual steak as well. So you've got your ribeye, the eye of the ribeye, the center section, and then the cap that goes around. This is probably the most tender cut of meat on a cow that you can make. It's very well marbled, it's very tender, juicy, it just kind of melts in your mouth once it's cooked. A lot of places will actually cut the cap off before they sell the ribeyes, and they'll sell this individually. Uh, yeah. Most places will, you know, some places leave it, leave it on, some will cut it off and just sell this for a lot more than they will the center section, just because it's, uh, it's much more well marbled and and just tastes better once once it's grilled. But two and we'll, after it's cooked, when I cut into them, I'll show you guys. So I like to cut the cap off first, then we'll slice the steak, then we'll cut the cap separately, so you get two different uh, tastes out of uh, out of the steak. Now one other thing you can do with your ribeyes, 
that's, uh, you can actually see the uh, composition guys will be doing this after uh, this afternoon. You can see this thing is uh, just kind of a little flaggy, right? It's, it's you know, kind of loose. You can take some butcher swine and then just tie it around. The main thing that it'll do is just kind of help it keep its shape so it cooks evenly and it's not going to kind of fall apart on the grill. Uh, this particular cut is still holding up its shape pretty well, but sometimes when you get them, you know, you pick it up and like this falls off, this falls off, so you can always take a little butcher swine, tie it around, and it'll cook much more evenly that way. So let's do one steak out of the uh, Sugar Valley Meats uh, roast. Okay, let's do the next one here. So we'll do the Wagyu. Okay, so again, we'll put this guy down. Two fingers, right? We're gonna, we're gonna try to get them all the same thickness so they'll cook at about the same time. Okay, slice right down. Okay, now this thing is really nice inside. We'll kind of come around so you guys can see because this is a really nice looking steak. We'll get some of this fat off the side as well. Okay, so here's the uh, American Wagyu uh, ribeye. And as again, you can see the difference in marbling, right? Between one and the other, just kind of even from a distance, you can tell that this one has a lot more marbling uh, than this one. Again, that's not to say that this steak is a lot better than this. They just have a little different mouthfeel and, uh, and taste of them. So let's put this one here. There you go. Are oh, you cutting the rest? Okay. Let's do the grain finish. So this one, this one actually has, right, I didn't even notice this one. So this one, has the bones still attached. So you've got three rib bones. So this would be the perfect prime rib roast. You'd cook it exactly like this on the grill, bone side down. So if you put this on a big green egg, the bones go on the grate. This is also gonna help protect the bottom of the roast from the heat, uh, which is why you always leave the bones on if you were cooking a whole prime rib like this. If you get it from the butcher or from your, uh, you know, from your store, and you wanna cut into individual steaks and the bones are still attached, we're gonna cut the bones off first to make slicing into steaks a little bit easier. So again, just take your knife. You can kind of pull the bones apart a little bit with your hand. You can see it's just starting to, starting to separate on its own. And you're just gonna follow the natural line of the bones to cut them right off the ropes. So just go like this. See how it's starting to come right apart. Okay. See, so they're separating, so we're getting our rows, our bones are getting cut off. One other thing you can do if you are cooking a whole rib roast is you just kind of do one of this with the bones, right? Just kind of cut them or separate them, but don't cut them all the way off. And then you can season the inside of this as well, put some fresh herbs in there, some rosemary, some thyme. Put the bones back on and then just use butcher swine to tie it back together, right? And then this whole thing goes on the grill and you get more of the flavor infused into the meat as it's as it's cooking. Okay. So this section here, let me see, let me cut this off, I'll show you guys. Okay, so these are the bones that we cut from the rib roast. Sometimes a grocery store will sell beef back ribs, right? They're kind of not fatty. It looks like you're getting just a rack of bones. This is what they're selling. This is called beef back ribs. Not a lot of meat on top, but there's a lot of meat in between the bones. Okay, so all the meat stayed on the rib roast, but there's plenty of that same very well marbled meat in between the bones. So that's why they sell this pretty cheap because it is still mostly bone, but it's a very easy thing to cook. You basically take this whole piece just like this, season uh, with your barbecue rub. This goes on the grill in direct heat, about 250 degrees, and this will take about, I don't know, three, four hours to cook. And you just cook until the meat is nice and probe tender. Meaning you take your temperature probe and it goes in without any resistance, pull it off, and the meat will just kind of 
melting about similar to a brisket point, like cheaper, like quicker to make uh, with the beef vectors. So that's that's where that comes from. Put that right there. Okay, so let's cut a steak from this guy. Yeah, kind of two fingers, nice and thick. Uh, yes, I do have a cut for that. Okay. Okay. So here's our third and final steak. And so this one, see, you can see this one kind of is a little bit more loose, right, than the other steak. So this would be the perfect steak to take a little butcher swine, just kind of tie around it so it stays nice and even. So you're going to, when you flip it on the grill, it's not going to fall apart on you. Okay, trim just a little bit of this fat off from the top. Okay. And this looks pretty good to me. Let me cut this off here too. Okay. So here's the grass, grain, and American wagyu. I'm just gonna leave these out. If you guys actually want to see, I'm gonna leave these guys out here. I'll leave these three steaks uncooked uh, on the cutting board, so after you can come up and take a look and see the difference between all three of them, what they look like before they, uh, they hit the grill. Okay, so Caleb's cutting the rest. Uh, the other thing that we have from our wonderful meat providers is, uh, see this here, can I do this here? We have some flat iron steaks. Uh, this one is uh, cut a little differently, so it's called a beef shoulder top blade steak. A little bit different, this is from Chankle Valley Ranch. And then there's the uh, flat iron steaks, which I think I left on my table. Hey Mike, the three steaks that are on the table, would you mind? Thank you. The uh, flat iron steak is, uh, has anybody here had a flat iron steak before? It's a little different cut. Nice. So this is, uh, when I tell people about a flat iron, it's almost like a mix between a New York strip and a filet. So a, like a filet mignon, which is cut from the beef tenderloin, thank you Michael, is, uh, is a very tender steak, right? Kind of, just kind of, this melts in your mouth, very, uh, very kind of a luxurious cut, but it's not super flavorful, right? So that's why Filets, a lot of times you wrap in bacon or you make sauces just to add a little bit of flavor to that uh, to that steak. A New York strip, on the other hand, has uh, much more flavor, but it has a lot more chew to it, right? It's not as tender as a filet. The filet iron is almost like a mix of the two. It's just as tender as a uh, filet and very flavorful, just like a New York strips. Uh, they're not, it's a, it's sort of a very, an uncommon cut, not very popular at, uh, at stores, but if you do see one, I do recommend you pick one up because it is a uh, it is a delicious cut. There's only two flat iron steaks on a cow, so it's not a again not not a lot of those out there. But what's the typical price difference between getting a flat iron or getting like a ribeye or something like that? Uh, the flat iron is actually pretty cheap because it's not a very well known cut. Uh, a lot of places won't even separate it. Uh, I forget which part exactly it comes on won't separate it from the, the, the primal loin to uh, get those individual cuts. So a lot of times you can pick these up on the cheap for a lot less than a, uh, than a filet um, and even a New York strip, so. And when you guys come up later to look at this, the marbling on these flat irons is, is kind of ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, so there's so much marbling on them. Um, I mean, yeah, so this going is, to the store and, and, and trying to pick out a steak when you're looking for marbling, Flat iron is definitely a, a cut that most people don't uh, don't know about, but very very tasty. Yes, uh, so like I said, these these are cut across the other side, so you can see all the marbling. A lot of times they come cut very thin like this, so it's not the best looking steak. But these cook super fast, right? Because it's super thin. The best way to grill these: high direct heat, uh, about two minutes per side max, and they come out delicious. 
Okay, let me take the rest of these out. So we'll leave one of each so you guys can get a good good look at what these steaks look like. Take the rest of them out here. Okay, okay. Finishing that, do you want to talk about uh, grill prep? Like, what do they need to get started uh, before they get the uh, the grill ready to cook their steaks? Yeah. So a couple. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of different ways of cooking steaks. Uh, the one that's very that's been very popular the last couple of years is called the reverse sear method, right? You've probably seen that on social media. I've done it a bunch of times too. That's the idea where you start your steak in direct heat, low temperature bring it up slowly, and then you finish it off over a high direct heat to sear the outside. That's a great method for thicker cut steaks, things like tomahawks or even thick cut ribeyes. So this one, like our ribeyes, is probably the max that I would go for cooking hot and fast, meaning we're not going to go the reverse sear method, we're just going to get the big green egg, get going nice and hot, we're going to put the steaks on, we're going to flip them about every minute or so, to create that nice crust on the outside and cook evenly on both sides. If you get anything thicker than this, I would go the reverse sear method, meaning you start indirect heat, go low and slow. Once it comes up, about 15 to 20 degrees shy of your target temperature, pull it off, put it on the direct heat side, and uh, sear the outside. You know, for years they always said you only want to flip your steak one time when you're cooking. And now the, the just heat flipping method has become really popular. You know, what's really the difference there? Yeah, so really, so what happens... So if you put a steak like this on the grill, high direct heat, right, you're going to put it on for, let's say, four minutes per side. Let's say this will probably take about eight minutes to cook total. So about four minutes per side. If I put this on four minutes, this, this one side that it's on or that high direct heat is just going to get scorched on the bottom and the outside is going to get way overcooked before the heat gets to the center of the steak, right? So we'll go four minutes, this gets overcooked, we flip, this side now gets overcooked, and you get this kind of thin little strip in the center that's your, you know, target temperature, but the outside edges are way overdone. So the kind of better way is you put the steak on the grate, high direct heat, you know, 45 seconds or so, and you flip. 45 seconds and you flip again. And you continue that until the steak is done. So what happens is you get just a little bit of the heat on the outside and it doesn't get way overdone and you still get that nice, even cook inside of the steak. So try it at home if you're used to kind of just doing the one or two flips. Try the just keep flipping method. Like I said, about every 45 seconds or so and, uh, and see what a difference that makes uh, you know, for you at home. So put these here. We'll leave these out there, okay. Let's put this right here. All right, so I'll leave these three steaks out, and then this uh, uh, flat iron and this blade steak. So we'll do one of each here so you can see, and then we'll do the rest uh, uh, by my area there so we can continue on with the other demos. As far as seasoning your steak goes, so we'll use my rub, uh, whatever you use at home. What I like to do is, just like we're doing here, I'll take the steak out of the fridge. If you're cutting a ribeye or a rib roast into individual steaks, make your cuts, right? Then you're gonna take your steak, we're gonna season very kind of generously on both sides, right? Just like that. Whatever falls off, just kind of get the edges of your steak. So you get a nice, nice and even very well seasoned steak, right? Just kind of what you're looking for. We're going to eat all of it, so you're going to make sure you season the whole thing. And we're going to leave it like this on your countertop at room temperature, and you'll go outside and you'll start your grill. So this is going to sit for about 20, 25 minutes or so. It's going to start to bring that steak up to room temperature. It's going to start to kind of sweat out a little bit and start to absorb that seasoning, okay? That's, that's what I found works best when I cook my steaks at home. If you just season, you know, and just hit the grill right away, a lot of the seasoning will either just fall off or burn off. And you want to let it, let it sit for at least a little bit, you know. 
And you'll see because the outside is going to start to kind of start to glisten a little bit, get a little wet on the outside. That's the moisture coming out and absorbing that seasoning. Um, let's see. Let me get this one here. Okay, so it's going to be the third one. So I can season both sides. And uh, the rub, by the way, is available at the Colway store on your way out. So you can check that out if you like it. Get a bottle, support me, and support the fine folks at Colway. Okay, let's season the uh, flat iron. Let me get one of these. And again, same thing. Just a nice even coat of spice. Both sides. Beautiful. Okay? Just like that. And let's do this uh, blade cut water. Okay, perfect. So these are some beautiful steaks. Beautiful rib roasts. Again, shout out to the sponsors for providing the meats. Be sure to uh, check them out because uh, this is this is some really high quality meat. So, okay, so our steaks are seasoned. You're gonna go outside. You're gonna start your uh, start your big green egg. Let me take a look here. So. So again, we're going hot and fast over direct heat. So I've got my charcoal in here. I've got the grate right over the top. Right now this thing is cruising at about 400 degrees, which is not as hot as I want it to be. But what's gonna happen is we'll open this up just a little bit. And when I put my steaks on and they start to cook, you know, every 45 seconds, we're gonna come back here, flip the steak, close the lid. Every time that you open it, it gets more air in there, more oxygen, and the fire is gonna continue to build. So if you start at 600 degrees and put the steak on, it's just gonna get burned on the outside. And it's not gonna be any good. So start just a little bit lower, and the temperature is gonna increase as you're uh, as you're cooking it. Uh, I need my tongs. Uh, which Michael? Tongs. Thank you. Uh, shout out to Michael, by the way. He's he's great. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's uh, let's get these guys on. We we'll get all three on. See, and even so, this has been sitting for just, just a few minutes. You can tell already that it's starting to glisten a little bit on the outside. It really doesn't take much, but just be sure to uh, let them sit for a little bit before you put your steaks on the grill. Okay, so we'll go three. So this, this is a large big green egg, so we're going to go three of these nice ribeye steaks and one of the uh, flat irons. And this blade cut steak, I could probably fit two more on here, but you don't want to crowd your grill, right? You don't want to put too much stuff on there because you want to make sure there's enough airflow to go around the steaks to get the air, to get the fire going. So don't put too much. Make sure there's plenty of space for other stuff on there. So so we're going to go, like I said, about 45 seconds. Uh, your this, are hanging. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. He is the best. He's the best. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's it. So again, cooking steaks is not really that complicated. Just get a meat thermometer. Really, that's the best tool that you can have to uh, monitor those internal temperatures. And I'll tell you how to check that as well. While he's going through and cooking these steaks, uh, any questions on big green egg? Any questions about barbecue in general, steaks, any of that? Just raise your hand. We can get those answered for Shout you. Shout them out, and uh, we'll uh, we'll go over everything. Everything you guys want to know. Don't be shy. Ooh. What charcoal are you using? What kind of charcoal are we using, Maje? Uh So we are using the uh, big Neck charcoal. Um, you know, lots of charcoal options out there. Really, the main thing to keep uh, keep an eye out for is consistency in the size, right? Like if you open a bag of charcoal and you just get you know, dust coming out and just really small pieces, that's not a really good charcoal. With long charcoal, you want a nice set of even pieces because that's going to provide the good airflow, right, which is what makes the big green egg such a good grill, but that only works if that, you know, that firebox isn't clogged up with tiny pieces of charcoal. So nice even sizes. At the end of the day, they all kind of work about the same. And so With the egg charcoal, uh, we do have three species of wood for big green egg charcoal. We have an oak and hickory which is what people know, it's our green bag. It's been around since we started. Uh, what we're using today is called natural hardwood. That's a eucalyptus blend. We get that from Brazil. 
Uh, we like eucalyptus because it's very sustainable. Uh, a eucalyptus tree can be cut down and regrow seven times before you have to replant. So it's nice that uh, they can do that just for charcoal down there. Um, the oak and hickory actually is a, a byproduct of the furniture and flooring industry. So when they square off a tree, the rest of the uh, pieces that are on there get turned into charcoal. That's how we make the oak and hickory over in Missouri. Uh, and then we also have Canadian maple. So the big difference, we got oak and hickory, that's gonna give you good medium smoke flavor. Eucalyptus is a little bit lighter of a smoke flavor and Canadian maple is almost no smoke flavor. So we're using eucalyptus today. You're gonna get a little bit of smoke, but not overpowering. I didn't know about the uh, eucalyptus tree. That you can cut it down. And... Well, you learn something every day. Yeah. There you go. I did not know that. See, so we're just kind of flipping this. Anything else? Questions? Bigger egg? Questions about magic? Move these over. Uh, glove, Michael. <laughs> Give it up for Michael, everybody. Yeah, I really could have done it without him. Yeah, you can see sometimes this happens too, uh, especially if your steak has that bigger fat cap, as that fat renders off and drips down. Right, that fire is going to flare up a little bit, but again, that always happens when you open the lid. Close the lid, that fire tends to go out. So, thank you, Michael. Have you tenderized with baking soda? Uh, the steak? The steak? Yeah. Uh, no, not really. I, I really just like to season ahead of time and just let it hang out for a bit before grilling it. Uh, I like using the uh, little well, baking powder on wings, but I've never really tried to bake the soda on steak. Do you find that it works pretty well? Uh, it has, yeah. Yeah. How do you, do you put that ahead of time, or uh, when do you put the baking soda on? It was five hours. Five hours. So just a little baking soda on the steak and just let it like back in the fridge for a couple hours? Well, they call it velvety, I guess. And okay. And you, you cover the steak or whatever meat you're trying to tenderize, and they recommend you wash it off. Yes, after you're done. Got it, okay. I have not tried that, but uh, sounds interesting. I might give it a give it a shot. What did you think today? There you go. Anything else? Ooh, yeah. This is looking really nice. And then you can see, I mean, it's can't really see from there, but the right side of the grill is where I'm getting a lot of my flare-ups. So it's just gonna kind of rotate the steaks on the grate, so it's not only just the one that's you know directly over the fire, so it gets a nice even cook on, uh, on all the sticks. How do you get sear on it? Sear, so that, that's searing right now, because this is over direct heat. So right now, so we were under 400 degrees when we started, and see now the temp is already at about 450 degrees just with a couple times that I opened the lid. So we can kind of damper this down a little bit. And every time that you flip, that, that crust is gonna continue to develop on the steak. So the first few flips doesn't look as nice as it's going to look towards the very end. And do you think it makes much difference using a pan versus cast iron grates versus stainless steel grates, using grill grates, all that? Well, so it's, I, I think that comes down to personal preference again. Cooking, if, if you sear a steak in a cast iron skillet, whether you do it on a grill or on your stove, you'll get that really nice crust right on the outside, but it, it's going to lack that kind of crust that you get from cooking over charcoal. That's why I like doing it directly on the grates, not in the cast iron skillet, because you get this, you know, that fire flavor in your steak that you otherwise wouldn't get if you do it only on the uh, cast iron. Uh, as far as the grates, I just like the uh, stainless steel grates. I think they were great. The <laughs> the grates were great. Uh, huh? That's good. Right? Okay. Right. I'll be here all day. He uh, is drilling with dad, so dad jokes yeah. are just uh, they just they just it. happen naturally. I don't even. But uh, the cast iron ones are fine too. I find that it's a little bit more maintenance on the cast iron grates compared to the stainless steel ones. So I like to I like to just do the uh, the stainless steel ones. Anything yeah. else? Yeah, steaks are cooking. So like I said, that's about a that's about a ten minute cook on those steaks. So again, I'm just going to continue flipping every forty five seconds or so. 
We'll start checking the internal temperature here in just a little bit. Uh, they're all about the same thickness, so they should finish at about the same time. The flat iron is going to come off first, because that was the thinnest one. And you'll see how much that flat iron kind of puffs up during the cook. It was super thin right before we put it on. And now when we pull it off, you'll see that it's actually a nice, nice and thick steak. If people want to find all your recipes, your products, all that good stuff, where can they find you? Uh, so the best way is grillinwithdad.com. That's my website. All my links are on there, all the recipes. All the stuff that we make, we post on the site, so it's all completely free. Uh, all the recipes, ingredients, methods. Most of my stuff is done on a big green egg, but you guys have other cookers or you want to do this inside, you can adapt the recipes and just do it, you know, whatever, whatever uh, tools you have uh, at home. Okay, let's check the uh, flat iron first. So when checking for internal temperature, I'm gonna close this so it doesn't flare up, right? So have your steak, right? Don't put your thermometer just right on top of all of this. You wanna insert it like into the side of the steak, right in the center. That's the most accurate reading you're gonna get, all right? So, okay, so this is at 127 right now. Right, so my target, anytime that I'm cooking for a medium rare finish, I want to pull off kind of just shy of 130, which is exactly where this is at. So I'm going to take this off, we'll put this, put this here, and now it's got to rest. Right, so 10 minutes, don't touch it, just let it hang out, and the temperature is going to continue to rise and get to about, you know, 133, 134, which is what you're going for. So we've seen on the reverse sear method, you don't really have to rest your steak, but if you do this method, you do have to rest your steak. What, uh, what's the reasoning behind that? So what happens when the reverse sear method is you start, you start low and slow, right? It gets to, let's say, 110, 115. You're going to crank up the heat to uh, sear the steak. That's your rest time, right? So when I pull up the steak on the indirect side, I'm going to open up the vents on the big green egg, let the temperature rise. That's technically the rest period of the steak, right? The muscles are going to start to relax a little bit. I still like to let it sit for just a minute after it's seared. But uh, you don't need to let it sit for as long as you would a directly cooked steak like this one. So if you directly cook it and you put it on your cutting board and cut right into it, what's going to happen? Yeah, so what happens, is, so the reason, right, the rest is important for two reasons. One, you get this carryover cooking, right? So we pulled it off at 127, 128. It's going to rest. It's still cooking inside, right? Even though it's off the grill, this temperature inside this meat is going to come up to about 133, 134 internal. The other part is that, right, just think of it this way. This grill is cruising about 450 degrees. We put the steak on, and just like it's a muscle, just like any muscle, it tends to kind of just contract, right? It seizes up because it's hit with this high heat, intense heat. So we pulled it off, and you got to let it kind of relax a little bit, right? It's going to relax. The muscle fibers will loosen up, and all the juices that are getting squeezed out of it right now are going to start to get reabsorbed inside the steak. If I cut into this right now, all the juices, all the flavors is going to come right out of it, right? You let it rest, it's going to loosen up a little bit, and it's going to stay inside the meat instead of running out. This is also a very good point for if you're cooking chicken, right? Especially with poultry, because, you know, people are, are very kind of nervous when they cook poultry because they don't want to serve raw chicken. You know, the ideal temperature or your safe eating temperature for poultry is 165, don't cook your chicken breast to 165, cook it to 160. Pull it off at 160, let it rest, and in five minutes it's gonna be at 165 and it's not gonna be overcooked. If you cook to 165, you're gonna pull it off, it's gonna rest, and then it's gonna be at you know, 170, 175, and then it's gonna be dry, you're gonna be like, well, I cooked it to 165 like the guy said, and it's dry, and it's, you know, pull it off sooner, let it rest, and I promise you it's gonna be much better. Any other questions or anything from Mashik? Okay, these questions are almost done. Have. These are sitting about 115 right now. Uh, so just another couple minutes and uh, they will be ready. Okay. Then we'll cook the rest on those grills. You want to let people come in? Yeah, if you guys want to come up uh, while well, these are finishing up, so you can take a look at the different cuts and what they look like and you can see what to look for You know, when you're at the store. Feel free, please come right up. See the seasoning, see the steaks. And we'll be cutting them in just a minute. Ooh, smoky. There we go. And you can see how they're on the grill as well. So Right? 
Yeah, it seems like you can see all the different states, all the different